when you think about training, there's a lot of things that comes to one's mind because training is uh, an added input to what you already know. It's an addition to the kind of work that you're doing, a renewal of uh, your knowledge, skill, and your ability. I think uh, training is an indispensable requirement for the development of any individual's personality. This training is very much essential for developing our skill, getting the latest knowledge and to apply this skill. The fact that you are exposed to education of any kind uh, does help in making you a, a better human being, I would say, in making you a more confident, a more mature kind of a, an officer and it helps you to contribute. Uh, better in uh, whichever sphere you are. The role of civil servants has undergone a radical transformation since independence. Now, they play a distinct role in policy formulation and implementation. Administration is no longer confined to mere maintenance of law and order and collection of revenue. The changing social, cultural, economic and political milieu has made administration more responsive, developmental, and consensuous. In order to meet the emerging challenges, systematic training of civil servants has become a must. The present focus on civil servants' training is based on the perception that the tasks which a civil servant has to perform in a developing country like ours demands skills for which a formal university education, however broad-based, can scarcely be adequate, nor can they possibly be acquired through experience alone. There are various institutions that are engaged in the training of higher civil servants in India, like Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy of Administration, Missouri, National Police Academy, Hyderabad, National Institute of Rural Development, Hyderabad, Administrative Staff College, Hyderabad, and Indian Institute of Public Administration, New Delhi. We offer a number of training programs, mostly meant for the senior administrators and senior managers, with the on-the-job experience ranging from 10 to 20 years or more. Specifically for civil servants, we have a training programs on management in government to give the management orientation as distinct from the administrative orientation, which they imbibed uh, from the British days. Then we have special programs to acquaint them with the environment like administrative environment in India and outside India. We have training programs on international trade to acquaint them with the international marketing scenario so that they can develop trade and commerce policies which are more favorable to India. We also have training programs on improving the human relation skills of the civil servants where the focus is on team building, conflict resolution, leadership style. The Indian Institute of Public Administration runs about 50 training programs each year. These are basically designed to help administrative personnel in government and in public enterprises to firstly appreciate recent developments in administrative, managerial and behavioral spheres. Secondly, to equip them with new concepts, skills, and techniques. And thirdly, to allow for attitudinal changes in order to internalize humanistic values. The National Police Academy today is the premier police training institution in the country. Here, IPS officers, after their induction in service, come for training. And the initial training is for eight months. They go to the state 
for practical training for another nine months and again come back for three and a half months training. Beside the training of IPS officers, immediately after their induction, we also go for training of the officers after certain years of service. We run three top level management courses. We also organize training of the trainers of police training institutions in the academy. Despite the fact that so much has been done for improving the quality of training, will it be correct to say that the civil servants are performing their role with full zeal and dedication? Are they aware of their ethical and moral obligations toward the public they serve? Have the remnants of colonial bureaucracy disappeared? Now, positive answers to these questions can only be found if our training program is effective enough. If our training aims at imparting of skills and knowledge to the civil servants, preparing them for higher responsibilities, arresting obsolescence, both individual and organizational, shaping adjustments with the changing environment, bringing attitudinal and behavioral changes, enhancing their career prospects in terms of professional expertise, individual growth, self-actualization, and high morale. Now, if you look at the trainees, trainees themselves, they come into training with two kinds of objectives. One is to see what are the things that can specifically help them in their work situation. The other thing is what kind of things they can get to improve their own self, their psychological self, their um, mental well-being, their physical well-being, and all that. The objectives of any training program are twofold. Acquiring theoretical knowledge in the areas of concern and field-based practical experience. There are broadly three types of training programs. Foundation training, post-entry training program, and in-service training program. Foundation training is imparted to all the personnel of All India Services and Central Services. The basic objective of this type of training is to expose the civil servant to the basics of administration, the constitution, socio-economic and cultural scenario. Uh, I've been looking after the courses of the IPS probationers, uh, their basic induction course, which is a sandwich pattern course. Initially, they come uh, to this academy on completion of their foundational course at the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, which is a 16-week course. And they come to us for 34 weeks in their first phase of training, after which they again go back to the field for practical training for 10 and a half months. And then they again come back to us for a uh, spell of 14-week phase two training. The basic uh, purpose of this uh, course is, as far as the IPS probationers is, are concerned, is to prepare them for the field to initially to hold charge of a subdivision and thereafter to hold charge as a superintendent of police. On completion of the uh, training in the first phase, we devote the last four weeks of the training to what is known as integrative training. That is, whatever we teach, all these subjects are integrated. Post-entry training aims at introducing the new recruited civil servants to the administrative environment and prepare them for future responsibilities. The civil servants are familiarized with their nature of duties and rules and regulations. In service training aims at providing the civil servants already in service some exposure to new developments in relevant fields. This gives him an, a, a, a chance to look at himself, look at the work that he has done so far, evaluate what he has done so far, and possibly look at perspectives that he should be taking in future what kind of inputs that he can derive from a learning environment, what kind of new perspective that he can evolve, what kind of new knowledge he can gain, what kind of um, uh, ways to look at things, what kind of new decision pattern that he can look at, so that in future the quality of his decisions become much better. Quality of his attitudes become much better, the quality of the way he looks at things becomes much better. This is what training is all about. For any training program to be successful, it is essential that the trainees learn in a conducive environment, proper infrastructural facilities are a must in order to get what is expected from training. We do have very good facilities here of swimming pool, you know, recreation clubs like a billiards table, chess, carom, 
and a beautiful lawn all scattered all over the place, lively place. Someone can go for a morning walk in the morning and enjoy. Some people go for swimming, playing tennis and badminton. One of our motto of the college is Sangat Swam, Sangat Dham, which means that let's learn together and let's live together and let's walk together. So we not only have sessions during daytime, even in the evening, sometime after dinner, they meet in groups and discuss some of the issues. Uh, so therefore, by and large, we have all the infrastructure facilities. Effective training methods are also required to make training result-oriented. The training methods should aim at self-training and group process so that there's a lot of interaction and experience sharing between the participants. The techniques that we presently use are apart from the lecture method and the use of the ordinary visuals like uh, the slides, etc. We have the case study method, we use the group discussion method, we use a simulation, we use role play exercises, we use uh, games, management games, and uh, we also use what we call as uh, project techniques. Some of these things are also video filmed. The outdoor side, we teach them weapons, we teach them tactics and so on, and we also test their endurance. We put them to practical exercises uh, in a one-week capsule in which we lay out certain uh, exercises for them. For example, we may give them a certain place where they have to conduct a raid on a hideout, or we may uh, send them out for a patrol and en route, we lay, our, uh, lay an ambush with our staff, staff. We take a video of how they react during the uh, ambush and thereafter this is discussed in the class. Another important aspect is how to deal with the public because uh, very frequently the complaint is that our uh, dealings with the public are not correct. So for that we have a one-week capsule on the police image in which we have sensitivity training and so on in which uh, we try to develop in the probation as the correct manner in dealing with the public. Uh, since the boys are fresh from college so discussion method is not of much use. So where the fresh inputs are to be given, then we have to resort to the, to the lecture method. But that we supplement with case studies, with cell model discussions, field visits, and other things like a person studies something in theory, goes on to see it being done, and later on practices it himself. So it uh, really gets deeply embedded into his mind what he has learnt. So this is for the basic courses. For the senior courses we have very little of lecturing because we find that senior officers generally don't like to listen to lectures. So we have depend mostly on the panel group discussion and the group discussion methods, the case methods, then we have syndicate studies and uh, they are asked to write papers make presentations. So these are the various techniques used for the senior officers courses. The purpose of training should be the guiding factor for determining the training method. It is the trainer's job to make all possible efforts to make learning more effective and interesting. Sometimes it is necessary to use training aids and equipment to enhance the intensity and pace of learning. Thus, a lot of planning and thought goes into making the training effective. Training cannot be static. It has to constantly change its objective methods, aids, and areas with the changing scenario. The global scenario is changing. Um, Indian scenario is changing. We have to progress much faster pace. So therefore, more and more in the civil service training, we'll have to emphasize that in the context of the change scenario, what is their role? And how do we very soon change from administrative orientation to result orientation, the management orientation? And uh, I think that uh, training can do a lot in bringing about the awareness of the new changes, not only in terms of technology, but the uh, systems, the procedures, the uh, marketing aspects, the communication uh, changes which are taking place all over the world. It is often seen that once the training program is over, the trainees go back to their places of work and whatever is learned through training 
It's either forgotten or remains unutilized. How much of the training component is useful to an individual or useful to an individual in his uh, back home situation or his work situation? There cannot be a definite uh, percentile figure to say, okay, 60% is useful, 70%, 80%, 90%. Now, it depends on a situational basis. It depends on the individual basis. It depends on the trainer also. And there are a lot of other subsequent factors also coming in. But basically, a large component of the training would be useful in two planes. Now again, I must say, one is things that are immediately useful. That the moment he gets back, he can the ideas that is generated or training can directly be implemented on the job. Now there is another kind of learning that comes out of training, a thing that is implanted in the psyche of a person subliminally, be below his level of consciousness. It may not be immediately applicable, but maybe 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, or maybe in, in an indefinite period in the future. He might come into a situation where he would suddenly recall, yes, I had discuss this kind of an issue in the training situation and this is what had come uh, as the best solution, this is what I can do. And at that point of time, training becomes useful. So there really is no single measure that says that training is useful in this period. Now, by and large, there have been studies conducted to say the utility of training is far higher in, in close proximity to the training period itself and it tapers off. But um, I'm not an advocacy of that kind of an evaluation method because training is a continuous process by itself and training cannot, each program may not be able to be taken in some kind of an isolation to say this program is this effective, this program is less or something because each program is interconnected. And when a person attends a program, he draws not only upon from this program, but also on the program that he's attended in the past. And he would use the knowledge in this program, the subsequent programs also. So the utility of a program has, of utility of training itself has to be taken not on a program to program basis perhaps, but on a, on a continuous uh, series as such. Proper feedback mechanism is a must. It should be ensured that knowledge and skills learned have some practical utility and the work environment of the trainee has some kind of sustenance ability. We also have a system of feedback. The feedback is uh, number one from the participants themselves, that is the probationers, uh, give us a feedback on the uh, the presentation and uh, whether some things could be d done in some other way. As you know, most of the professionals who join us, we have a large number of engineers, MBAs, postgraduates, and so on. So they have uh, definitely an idea on, on various ways in which a uh, class could be conducted. And we uh, take a feedback from them. And based on their feedback, we do make modifications in our training program. In addition to this, we also take uh, feedback from the uh, SPs. That means when they go for their practical training to the SPs. So we get a feedback from them that during the last 10 and a half months, what shortcomings have we noticed, noticed in this position? Based on their feedback, we make certain corrections. In addition to this, there is a meeting uh, of the Director Generals of Police. There is the Academy Board where there are uh, some of the Director Generals and uh, heads of Central Police Organization who are members. They also give us suggestions regarding the shortcomings that they find in IPS offices in the field and accordingly we make corrections in our training. Ideally the situation would be uh, to have a before and after kind of an evaluation where you have a, a knowledge level, an attitudinal level, a perception level or basically the level of a person before he comes to the training and uh, uh, over a period of time you can check as to what is the advantages or the use of this training, uh, the knowledge gained or the perception, new ideas gained or innovation that is planned as a consequence of this training program after the program itself. So you can have a comparative figure as to what has happened be before and after a training situation. Though attitudinal and behavioral changes cannot be brought about by training alone, emphasis is to bring about these changes in trainees through a well-conducted training program. We did some follow-up studies whether we have been able to bring about change in the attitudes. Now, they did mention that their attitudes have changed to some extent and they are trying to apply the new concepts they have imbibed during the training. But uh, our studies indicate that when they go back, they are very enthusiastic. They want to develop new leadership style, manage differently. We talk about participative management and, and they say that yes, we are trying to practice participative management. But over a period, we found that they relapse back to the original ideas. The major challenge before training institutions today is how do we prevent this relapse phenomena? Because then they don't change when they cease to change. So we take into account now in some of our uh, training activities 
but when we preach certain things to them and we want them to implement, we also type, talk in our training what resistance they will face and how to overcome that so that they are aware of the kind of obstacle they will face and they will make a conscious attempt to bring about the change, but it's a very, very slow process. Young officers would join on the first day as probationers straight from their homes. Uh, we record their first interviews on, uh, on video. And after eight months when they're leaving back for home, you play back the video and look at the boys who are now going back after eight months of training. There is a tremendous amount of difference in their behavior. Training has to be closely linked with research. The trainers have to be sincerely engaged with research activities in order to update their skills and knowledge. Research in any given area is of uh, tremendous use and help because a lot of uh, conclusions can be drawn at the end of any particular research. Uh, maybe I'm not uh, very well up to the data that is there, but personally I am of the opinion that the level of research or the amount of research that has been done in the police, on police subjects and police related subjects, uh, there is there is a scope for going in for a little more research and uh, making it institutionalized so that we can use this as a database and keep reverting back to it wherever, whenever we need it. The trainer must have an aptitude for research if training has to be improved. Curricular development in training has to be taken up very seriously. Now, if you're going to draw a curriculum, with it, the organization itself should be clear that what kind of input is required in this training process. Now, the organization is in the best place situation where they can dictate what kind of situation is required, will be in a position to understand what kind of training is required. Now, the organization cannot maybe abdicate its position and pass it down to another institution who may be set off from the reality by one step, who may not be able to understand specifically what the, uh, what the uh, client organization requires or the resident organization requires. Now, on the other hand, if, if, it is, if the resident organization is not in a position to conduct its off-the-job training and would like to have an external intervention coming in, then the, care should, then the important thing is the care should be taken that there is an, a thorough briefing of the external agency as to what are the specific requirements, what is the resident situation, that the external agency should have a thorough understanding of the organization, its functionaries, and the expectations from the functionaries. It's only after that that the uh, uh, trainer himself will be in a position to draw up a specific curriculum which would be best suited to maximize the gains from the training process for the participants themselves. The growing emphasis on training reflects the fact that in a world of growing specialization and fast changing technology, the civil servants have to update their knowledge and be familiar with current trends, latest training techniques and aids. So we can say that there is a strong need for systematic and effective training of civil servants. It should mainly concentrate on proper training techniques and aids, systematic feedback mechanism, well-defined link between training, research and curricular development, and positive attitudinal and behavioral changes. Training can do a lot and it's not a one-time process. Largely an investment rather than an expenditure. Largely an investment rather than an expenditure.